Hello, welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Raska Kamil from Kamla Nehru College, University of Delhi. Today I'm going to discuss module City in History, Medieval Period and Renaissance, which comes under the paper Geog Urban Geography. First of all, let's discuss what could be the learning outcomes of this module. While going through this module, you'll be able to comprehend the characteristic features and structure of medieval cities, rise of mercantile cities, transformation of cities to the 20th century. So let's begin. With the decline and fall of the West Roman Empire, which occurred between 400 and 476 AD, we find a corresponding change in the whole way of life of the, of the Western Europe. Invasions of the Germanic tribes by the beginning of the 5th century led to the breakdown of the Western part of the Roman Empire. With the fall of Roman Empire in the 5th century, they marked the effective end of urbanization in the Western Europe, which stretched for 600 years. So from the 5th to 17th century, cities in Europe grew only slowly or not at all. The reasons being, after the collapse of Roman Empire, urban localities became isolated from one another and had to become self-sufficient in order to survive. Islam spread in the 7th and 8th century AD and a part of the world was basking under the glory of rise of Islam. The decline of cities that characterized medieval Europe did not happen everywhere. In East Asia, mostly in China, numerous cities founded before the Christian era remained inhabited and economically viable. Most of the cities of Asia, though with a population less than 1 million, were still larger than cities in Europe maybe because of very different political or cultural systems and geographical environments of the great Asian civilization. The raids of Norsemen in 9th century AD, which completely eliminated trade between cities. With the loss of trade, the entire region became isolated. Also, agriculture productivity declined. The people rather became more preoccupied with defense and survival. Disruption, ruggedness, and non-maintenance of the then existing transport and communication networks that further hindered interaction. Agriculturalist tribes dominated Europe, who preferred small village commun communities rather than the large towns. There were three different types of forms of cities in this period based on the historic origin. There was a rectangular system with growth spreading outward slowly from this rectangular area in response to topographic characteristics. The second type of cities developed in spontaneous manner with an irregular, disorganized form in which circuitous, winding cow path developed into streets. A third form in which the towns were designed in advance of its settlement, that is, a planned towns. These towns were mostly laid out in fairly rigid gridiron pattern. The central area was reserved for the market and public assembly. Many cities of the time had remnant elements of all the three forms, which had developed at different stages in the growth of the city. The characteristic that was common amongst them included the castle, the abbey, the cathedral, the town hall, the marketplace, and the wall with one or more gates. The economic functions of the cities remained essentially as they were market centers for the agricultural surpluses. Inland commerce grew in importance but was not at par with that of the Mediterranean Sea. Therefore, some cities of the Western Europe had their growth stimulated growth greatly by the port function, especially the port of Marcellus. With the invasion of Islam in the period from 571 to 711 AD, trade ties between Germanic kingdoms on the west and the Byzantine Empire on the east was abruptly broken. Muslim founded new cities on the African shore like the Tunis and Cairo. Two of the basic attributes of the cities were a middle class population and a communal organization. During the 10th century, commercial revival was marked with the reopening of long distance trade routes and the presence of urban nuclei represented by fortified settlements. Most urban residents spend their lives within the walls of the city. They thereby developed close-knit societal structures. Cities were scattered at regular intervals over the country. The increase in the number of the citizens continued only until the city was full. So, Middle Ages developed no large city. 
as the number of monasteries were often respected by the Pagans of the Dark Ages, so it was natural for them to form nucleus of cities of the future. Towns like Würzburg, Brandenburg, and Oldenburg, that's Germany, originated as religious foundations. The castle of the local baron or the knight acted as a nucleus of the town with the development of feudal regime. They were built of wood, usually upon artificial mounds. In times of danger, the peasants abandoned their hovels and fled within the walls until the enemy withdrew. Slowly, with the influx of the peasants into the walled towns, they developed an important institution of guild. The guilds defied feudal lords, so the cities became stronghold of trading class. With the revival of trade in the 11th century, great fairs were held at the regular intervals which attracted traders from over the continent. Universities such as Cambridge became a part developed from these trade fairs. Others include Byzantium, Augsburg and Venice. Better tools were evolved and crafted. Horses were used in transportation, windmills were constructed in large number and there was a massive increase in the cropland. The 13th century saw cities as a small, walled and not overcrowded. Gardens were numerous within the walled city and gradually, with the time, they were filled with inferior dwellings. Venice and Milan, with a population of 10,000, were large cities of Europe at that time. During the 15th century, the shop and the house were contained in the same building. Often the rooms were built around the courts, with the shop fronting on the street and the living room over the shop, while the bedroom was over the back. Also at this time, the glass became common in windows and inside fireplaces with well-built chimneys were the rule. Houses were usually half timber and stucco in the Western Europe, though the store was also used were more important dwellings. Baths were obtained only at public baths and much more cooking was done at public bakeries than in the home. In these early walled towns, it was unusual for the streets to be arranged in regular plan. Various traders were segregated in special quarters and the streets penetrated these quarters rather haphazardly. The chief meeting place of the town was the market square, which often faced the main church of the town. The power was often shared between the feudal lords and the religious leaders. The guild, church and feudal administration determined the social status of an individual and their position. But the social and economic constraint inherent in the dominant social system of feudalism stalled the revival of feudalism. Feudalism was a form of social organization. Feudal lords, who formed status hierarchy headed by the monarch, politically legally dominated the direct producers. Social relationships under the feudalism were not defined through market interactions. They were legally defined and the whole society was organized in terms of a formal and rigid hierarchy of power and dominance. The main focus was on self-sufficiency and local markets. It thereby restricted innovation and con commercial expansion. Since the amount of surplus value extracted by the feudal lords in rent and taxes was dependent less on the market force than on the expenditure requirements which increased as they competed for the political status through conspicuous consumption. There was insufficient reinvestment in the productive capacity of agriculture and industry. During the centuries of the Dark Ages, an economy based on exchange was replaced by economy of consumption. But a new merchant class emerged on the edge of the feudal society amongst the landless men, scaped serfs, casual harvest laborers, beggars and outlaws the bold and the resourceful among them being the people, quick with language, ready to fight or cheat became the chapmen or the peddlers, carrying their wares to remote hamlets. They were paid in pennies and local products like beeswax, rabbit fur, goose kills, sheep skins, etc. If they prospered, they could settle in the center. The merchants made town and needed walls, wall builder, warehouses and guards artisans to manufacture their trade goods, cart builders and smiths. They needed farmers and herdsmen outside wall to feed the bakers, brewers, butchers within. They introduced self-government substituting economy for one based on land and thus were likely to oppose local lord. 
and became supporters of king. Towns recruited manpower by offering freedom to any serf who would live within their wall for a year and a day. Merchant and craftsmen in the guilds saw the possibilities of free cities where a person could reach his or her potential within a community setting. Over time, commerce expanded the function of the city and linked it to the expanding power of the state resulting in a system called mercantilism. The main purpose was the use of power of the state to help the nation develop its economic potential and population. The cities at this time were the centers of assembly, places of observance of religious rites, local markets and political and judicial centers. Also military needs were provided for the cities of this era to protect refugees and treasures of the society. Medieval England had a very few towns. Most of the people in the medieval England were villagers and their main occupation was farming. Religious centers attracted settlements which transformed into towns or cities. Some of the examples of the cities include Canterbury, York, Bath, etc. These were big cathedral cities that attracted traders, pilgrims and masses. Medieval towns tended to grow around areas where people could easily meet, such as crossroads or rivers. Towns were mostly settled near to water sources as regular water supply was required. Rivers would provide the water used for washing and drinking and they were used for the disposal of sewage. The regrowth of towns in Europe coincided with the decline of the feudal system and was related to increase increasing economic and political power of an emerging middle class of merchants opposed to economic regulation of their activities by feudal lords. The urban bourgeoisie of merchants, manufacturers and finances organized into guilds obtained freedoms notably right to supervise their own markets. Successful towns obtained charters from the kings and in England were known as boroughs. In the more urbanized parts of the Europe, many towns such as Milan, Florence and Cologne were able to become self-governing municipalities, capable of independent political action. In northern Italy, a competitive society of rival city-states had emerged by the 13th century, providing foundation for Italian Renaissance. The power of commerce and trade in medieval urbanism is exemplified in the German city of Lübeck situated at the western end of the Baltic Sea. Lübeck developed into the nucleus of German Baltic trading system. In Lübeck, the towns had a medieval cathedral and monasteries, but it was dominated by central marketplace. This consisted of shops of merchants and craftsmen concentrated together in the area like street of baker, spice merchants, trade tailors, etc., with a living quarter located above the shop. A mint, the new urban engine of medieval money economy, was located close to the marketplace. Medieval towns did not sever links with the surrounding areas, but enjoyed a symbiotic relationship with the countryside. In particular, medieval towns, with their poor hygiene and higher mortality, grew only because of the influx of rural Im immigrants seeking employment and economic opportunity. Many cities such as Venice and Nuremberg annexed large areas of the surrounding lands to guarantee food supplies. With an aim towards profit maximization, the city lord ensured that there were more merchants in a town so that more tax could be collected by sheriffs. The system became vulnerable to abuse and corruption as common man could not read and write and that is why many people in the town wanted to get a charter. A charter gave people in a town certain rights that were clearly stated in the charter that the town had. Many charters gave town the right to collect their taxes, thus removing corrupt sheriffs from doing so. It was also common for a town to ask for its own law court so that the legal problems could be settled quickly. Boundaries and fences delineated cities and an ample amount of security was provided to the traders both local and outside, and to the goods. Many towns had large fences built around them and the gates of these fences were locked at night to keep out the undesirables. 
Cities such as York and Canterbury had city walls that served the same purpose. The towns were fortresses. Residences and fortresses sprang up everywhere at the start of the 9th century. Each of this fortification commonly was known as Burg, Borough, Borg or Borgo, depending upon the language. These burgs usually were circular in form, with a wall and a moat. In the centre of the walled enclosures was the strongest structure, the last defence in the event of an attack in which a permanent military garrison was stationed. The ruling authority had a residence in each of the burgs in its domain and very often a chapel or a church and a building to house a clergy were a part of this central complex. The early medieval village and town experienced little in the way of sanitation problems. But as cities began to take shape, serious pollution problems arose from the accumulation of human waste, from the decay of accumulated corpses and from garbage. Towns became dirty places to live in. There were no sewage system. Open drains carried toilet wastes. Rats were very common in towns and cities and led to the Black Death of 1348 to 1349. Water was far from clean as a local river would have been polluted with toilet waste thrown into it from the village, both upstream and downstream. Therefore, as people used this as a source of water, for that they had no choice and because people knew little about health and hygiene, disease was common. The English Parliament in 1388 passed an act that forbade the discarding of garbage into open waterways. It was not until 1543 in the city of Bunzelow, Cilicia, that the first public sewage plant and the water works was developed. Piped water to individual houses started in the 17th century. Also, there was a granary and a storehouses in which to store the food in case of a siege. This food being provided by our surrounding peasants. Above the burg was a military establishment with secondary functions of religious administration headquarters. The burg was not really a city, but cities did begin to take shape outside the walls of burgs that were predecessors of large cities to come. Another feature was guilds, which were, with the exception of the church, the widespread representative of corporate life. The first guild for which there were records were in Germany, Italy and France. A guild was an association or fellowship of persons engaged in the same type of economic activities and it structured the productive population along the occupational lines. But at the same time, there were strong religious aspects of the guild system. A guild provided cohesiveness to the productive population. Merchants, tradesmen, craftsmen, shopkeepers and other formed independent guilds under the guidance of church and the nobility continued to collectively make strides forward with regard to the commercial life of the city, where they were most commonly found. The guild was not the part of the agrarian scene. Craftsmen's shop come house doubled as a trade grew and attracted masses to the city. A sign outside of the shop showed people what that person did for a living. Signs had to be used so as few people could read or write. The signs regulated the condition of the production, distribution and marketing and the role of the working class was upgraded. The inhabitants of the town followed a law, a curfew whereby no one came out of their home after a particular time at night for the security reasons. The houses were made of wood. A building of medieval town was expensive as land cost a great deal. That is why many medieval houses that exist today appear odd in that they have a small ground floor, a large second floor and even larger top floor as builders built up and out to keep the cost down. The houses of most of the people were two or three stories, high in continuous rows, which is to say they were common wall dwellings and when located on a large blocks, they often had inner courts. Heating of room became less of a problem, however, when the fireplace and chimney began to replace the open hearth. Fireproof roofing, stone and tile construction and whitewashed thatched roofs came into wider use, leading to fewer devastating fires. In the 14th century, the urban homes were often the workshops stored that provided the livelihood of the occupants. All in all, the medieval home with its extended family, 
lacked two desirable attributes, privacy and comfort. The early medieval village and towns experienced little in the way of sanitation problems. But as cities began to take shape, serious pollution problems arose from the accumulation of human waste, from the decay of accumulated corpses and from garbage. Piped water to the individual houses did not get wide use until the 7th century. Communes were first recorded in the late 11th century and the earlier 12th century, thereafter becoming a widespread phenomena. They had a greater development in the central northern Italy, where they were real city-states based on the partial democracy, whereas in Germany they became free cities independent from the local nobility. The walled city represented protection from the direct assault or at the prices of the corporate interference on the pettiest levels, but once a townsman left the city walls, he was at the mercy of often violent and lawless nobles in the countryside. Because much of the medieval Europe lacked central authority to provide protection, each city had to provide its own protection for citizens both inside the city walls and outside. Thus, towns formed communes, a legal basis for turning the cities into self-governing corporations. There were presence of rural communes, especially in France and England. These were formed to protect the common interest of the villagers. Almost every town had its commune. No two communes were alike, but ruled by a common tenant. Communes were sworn allegiance of mutual defense. Whenever a commune was formed, all its participating members gathered and swore an oath in a public ceremony. They allied to defend and safeguard each other in times of trouble. In the period of Renaissance, many social changes developed, which had a marked effect on the plans of the towns of the time. In early medieval times, the church was very powerful, but as the time lapsed, it became recessive. Two other factors also operated the court and the improvement in artillery. As artillery became stronger, the old straight walls offered little protection to the powerful cannon and the military engineers began to develop starship walls of the 6th century. Later ravelins were built in front of the main wall and ultimately the plan of the fortress became a geometrical puzzle. Example, Acropolis town of Nice in the southern France. The power came into the hands of those who controlled armies, trade routes, and large amount of capital. There was consolidation of dispersed feudal states and creation of continuous political administration, with the more powerful cities seeking to overcome their weaker neighbors. There was rise of autocratic organization and bureaucracy, which was accompanied by development of the office building. Since the growing population, including refugees from the adjacent countryside, were confined within such fortifications, there was a severe overcrowding and increased population densities. Four to five storey buildings were constructed. There were instances of eight or more storey buildings being constructed in Edinburgh. There also arose a new perception of space in which developed a baroque city in which the avenue became the most important symbol. The baroque city had several major broad avenues as opposed to the narrow alleys of the former times. The development of the linear avenues was based partially on the artistic considerations, but also was the result of a more widespread use of wheeled vehicles, which were not suited to the narrow winding lanes of the medieval city. The avenues were not only wanted for the commercial movement, but they were vital for the military movement. Accompanying the development of the broad avenue in the Baroque city was the building of a magnificent palaces for the nobility, along with the ornate fountains and gardens. So much of the civic activity revolved around the court and that a new element arose to accommodate visitors. This was hotel. Most cities formed between 16th and 19th century in the Europe either were places of residence of kings and princes such as Versailles, Karlsruhe and Potsdam or were garrison cities that were seats of real power in absentia. Another development of Baroque city was the residential square, an open space surrounded by exclusively residential structures and including perhaps a church. 
These squares, established after 1600, met the needs of the upper class. The essence of the barrack city was its geometric regularity, involving a number of broad diagonal avenues radiating from a given point and producing an asterisk shape pattern. It often was implemented without regard to economic cost or to the other urban function. In spite of its shortcomings, the barrack plan provided the layout of a number of large cities in the 20th century, such as Tokyo, New Delhi, San Francisco and Chicago. A modified form of barrack plan was followed in the development of Washington DC, with the only major component missing being fortifications of the barrack city of the 16th century. Mumford introduced the term barrack to define the change in planning, which was marked by a great scientific and mechanical discoveries. It was also reflected in the towns by adoption of geometric designs. At the same time, it was the age of absolute monarchs, whose general policy was to concentrate their power in one's centers. They built large and imposing palaces as an emblem to their authority. London, Paris, Naples and Milan became the cities with a population of 2 lakh or more. One of the main features of the barrack city is the dominance of avenue. Wider streets became necessity as vehicles became larger. A marked separation of classes into rich and poor developed and segregation into mansions and slums became noticeable. Straight streets were admired and the old cul-de-sacs of the medieval towns were often swept away. Example, Karlsruhe. The streets were laid out in the form of a fan radiating from the castle or a wheel shape. There were no less than 36 streets radiating from the palace areas, which however do not meet at the center, so that there is no usual difficulty of crossing. The administrative quarters were housed in the fine building around the plaza, fronting a place ornate with museums, art galleries, department of finance, justice and mining. Over the period of time, Karlsruhe spread far beyond the area. This made buildings cluster at the suburbs along the main outlets of the original towns. Streets were arranged in a checkboard fashion. In Germany, many other cities to adopt it such pattern like Potsdam, Mannheim and Munich. And still a salient feature of such American cities as Washington as of 1791 and in modern times of the improved plans of Detroit. H. Fleur, in Geographical Review of December 1920 issue of New York, gave main features of towns in the Northern Europe. He pointed that cities depended upon trade. There must necessarily be a progressive change in the city types as we proceed from the west, say in the France, to the east in the central Russia. To explain, Fleur makes a special reference to Toulousia, a town on the east banks of the Garonne River, an important place before the Romans captured it. In the center of the city, Romans placed the forum or the marketplace. Later, when Christianity reached Toulouse in the second century, churches were built in the city. Cathedrals were towards the south and formed the nucleus of the town. They had a place or open square fronting. Fleur uses Ghent to illustrate this third zone in which commerce was more important than the Roman tradition or the early church. Ken situated in the lowland, divided into 24 insular districts, separated by the narrow waterways. In the 14th century, it was linked with England by means of wool trade, but later its waterways silted up. Moving to the western Germany, which later formed margins of Charlemagne Empire, has been the scene of warfare throughout the centuries. Partly of this, for this reason, many of the older towns have developed around the castle like Heidelberg. Further east, fairs determined the growth of the cities like Augsburg, Leipzig, may be instanced as another German city whose growth has been largely influenced by its famous fairs. Eastern Germany, Bohemia and Poland were all threatened by invaders long after the West Europe had become stabilized. The eastern zone deals with towns which have developed around Acropolis, type of nucleus or with veritable marginal forts such as a rose in the limitless fo forests of the northern Russia in the medieval times. Example Prague, capital of Bohemia. Far to the east in the Moscow, the first settlers were probably Finnish tribes. Moscow lies on a meander of a small river 
Moscow. And the evolution of town in a series of concentric circles. A log fort was built on the north bank and this in time developed into the great Kremlin fortresses. Alongside was a small district called Kitoy Gorod or the city of refuge. Outside this area developed the Belia Gorod or the white city where the better classes lived and the outer analysts constituted Zemlanoi Gorod or the peasant city. The Kremlin was the Acropolis of Moscow with walls as high as 40 feet. Within them were the numbers of barracks, arsenal palaces and churches as well as other buildings. From the 7th century on, the impetus of the growth expansion, aerial and economic growth were the merchants, financiers and landlords. With the gradual development of commercial city, financial transactions gave rise to new economic activities. The significant aspect of urban society at this time was change in attitude towards land. Under the feudal system, land was leased for a long period and was not sold. This created a stability and continuity in the use of land resources. After the 17th century, land became to be regarded as a commodity. Land rent rose substantially and took larger and larger share of workers' income. The greater gain was to be made from degraded and dilapidated land use. And it was true for London, New York and Paris before the middle of the 19th century. City life during this period was subjected to commercial speculation, social disintegration and physical disorganization. At the same time, cities were multiplying in number and increasing in size throughout the Western world. With the rise of the contemporary city, individual lots and block became units for buying and selling without regard for the historic uses, physical conditions or social needs. The reason that this pattern appears more representative of American city is because the city is developed in US with the exception of New England. The walls around the cities of Western Europe after the 17th century had been made obsolete as a defense measure. It rather served as a deterrent to the aerial expansion of mercantile cities. At the end of the 18th century, cities had a fewer inhabitants than they had in the 300 years earlier. The development that stimulated city growth at this time was mainly the Industrial Revolution. Urbanization increased in direct proportion to industrialization. After the 1830s, the development of the factory production and the new methods of transportation created needs for employing more workers in developing industrial centers. It stimulated migration from the non-urban areas. Of the prime importance in creating the rise of factory city was the development of steam engine. This created new energy needs, especially for the coal. The main elements of the new urban industrial complex were the factory, the railroad and the slum. The factory formed the nucleus of the new urban organization. The factory generally occupies the best sites in the cities. The workers who were vital to the industrial process often resided in the quarters. These quarters were comparable to the lowest serf dwellings in the medieval period. In such districts, there was no open space except the lane between the rows of dwellings which was receptacle for the accumulated rubbish. There was not much improvisation on toilet facilities either. The sanitation condition was still deplorable and it resulted in spread of infectious diseases. However, 19th century saw some advances being made in the production of glazed drains and cast iron pipe. It enabled the distribution of better quality of water to increasing number of dwellings units as well as the disposal of sewage. Open space in form of small park began to appear in minimal mounds. Hospitals were more widespread, street cleaning was emphasized and private toilets became common in most dwelling units. The 19th century is also marked for its development of suburb. When the repressed workers gained financial sufficiency, they tended to escape the overcrowded, unsightly and unsanitary city by moving to an adjacent community where the living conditions were better. Those suburbs existed before. But with the advent of the railroad between 1850 and 1920, plus the coming of electric trolley in the 1880s, suburbs began to develop on the margins of many large cities. These early suburbs were small with a population of not more than 5,000 people. It was the wealthy class that resided in these suburbs.
The early 20th century marked the rise in the private automobile. This enabled people to shift more towards suburbia. However, the problems that they were trying to escape reappeared. Congestion, impersonality, water problems, overcrowding, sewage disposal, pollution and high po population densities became the problems of suburban dwellers. That's all. Hope from this module you would have learned about the medieval cities. Thank you.